Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Now, today we're joined by someone who, yes, has the sales ops experience and expertise, but also came from not the dark side, but from the other side of customer support operations. Alicia, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, and so this is super interesting because uh, since we started doing this podcast, we've had more people coming on and talking about revenue operations, right? Um, which yeah. supposedly encompasses support as well. So this is going to be interesting to understand your background and experience there and how that relates to what you're currently doing in sales ops. So first question, yeah. can I ask why you made that jump from support to sales? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, kind of by accident. Uh, so I went to school briefly um, and just fell into different roles. I actually started in HR originally, I recruited for a while. Um, that role ended up, it was at a startup. I ended up kind of moving into this project coordinator role by chance. And um, one of my initial projects was migrating us from one applicant tracking system to the next. And so the technical project management piece of it was super interesting to me. And I just had an opportunity to join another HR ATS company. And they were um, hiring a CSM, which I had never heard of at the time. I mean, this was back in like maybe 2009, 2010. So that was a very foreign thing um, that I wasn't familiar with. But jumping into it was really interesting, right? So it's a ton of relationship management. It's project management. Um, and that company, as it started to grow, I had the opportunity and just kind of fell into building out and leading a team. Um, and for me, the post-sales journey was something that was completely new. I think it was really kind of new in the industry as well, right? Like you had traditional support, um, but this is beyond support, right? This is really trying to drive user adoption and ensure that customers are reaching their outcomes. So I did that for about four years at Compass. And then, um, you know, as I started growing within that position, the operational piece was what was super interesting to me. So building out processes and just kind of understanding and working with finance, right? Um, so then, you know, four years later, kind of time to move on. Um, I joined another small company called SourceClear, and they hired me specifically for customer success operations. So really building their playbooks from the ground up. Um, they were acquired by CA, and uh, that our portion of the business was going to be absorbed into Veracode at the time. And I had, you know, a, a colleague that was working at Sauce Labs who said, hey, we're looking for a sales ops person. And what's really interesting is that you have CS experience. And so that might be a good blend for us to have as we're building out kind of our end to end journey. Um, so, I, you know, it, it did kind of fall by accident, but I absolutely love it. You know, I think um, I've learned a ton so far and there's so much to learn, but it's kind of great experience to have end to end at this point. And um, yeah, it's, Kind of how I fell into it. For sure. And I think there's one thing you said in one of the earlier roles about how you like the technical project management. Yeah, that, that was when you were a CSM, right? And yeah. I assume that was the part of the role that you were like, yes, I want to do more of this. And then that was the reason you moved from being a customer success manager to doing customer success ops. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Cool. That, that and more specifically, you know, as I was hiring a team, it was very evident that you need to have some sort of process that you can kind of rinse and repeat, right? And apply at scale for your customers as you're bringing them on. Um, and, you know, for our system, it was an applicant tracking system. So, you know, agencies and internal HR companies would leverage our system. And so every process is different. And being able to know how to kind of put a process in place to get people up and running um, was something that we had to do and, and figure out quite quickly just to reduce our churn at the time. Got it. And then as you quite rightly said, as part of this well, as part of CFM and as part of customer success ops, you kind of are responsible for some selling anyway with the renewals, et cetera. Yeah, definitely. I think for us at the point, um, we were really focused on mitigating churn and uh, just ensuring that direct, uh, user adoption was really high. Um, so we didn't really tie too much of the revenue to CSMs. Of course, like their book of business is directly tied to like their bonuses and whatnot. So there's incentive, obviously, to want to renew that, that base of yours. Um, and then moving into sauce as well, that was something that we really started to focus on, which 
I think for any initial company, when you're applying a customer success team, you know, I think the first and um, most important thing is really driving onboarding and understanding what those use cases are and what those outcomes are and how to measure those effectively. Because if you don't have onboarding, then trying to, um, trying to get that customer reengaged later in the process is a lot of time and resources, and, and it proves to be pretty difficult if you don't get them kind of initially onboarded well. Got it. And then fast forwarding today, what's the size of the sales team you're operating and what's the size of the ops team that you're working with? Yeah. So at Influx Data, um, fairly new, this is week four for me, um, but we have, I think we have about 15, between 15 and 20 sales reps right now and it's split between commercial and enterprise and a strategic team. Um, on the ops side, there's technically two of us. So there's the director of ops who I report into, um, but we kind of have a little rev ops team that we're working with. So that also um, bridges over to the two folks who are managing our SDR team. Um, and then also our person who's running our lead gen team as well. Got it. So are the FDRs within the 15 to 20 number? No, they actually fall in, under the marketing umbrella. Oh, cool. So you don't, you don't get involved with the with the FDRs? Um, not technically. I mean, while they don't report into us, I think so far, just in the short time I've been here, we're pretty cohesive. Marketing and sales partners really well together. So we're constantly talking about, you know, the SDRs metrics and what they're doing right now versus how that's impacting sales, especially given the current climate. So um, there's a lot of collaboration that happens there. Got it. And as you mentioned that, since I assume now everyone's remote, Is there any, like, what's changed? Are you using any different tools or any different processes to ensure, like, the team culture and to ensure productivity? Yeah, our people ops team is pretty amazing. So I think, like everyone, we're leveraging Slack and Zoom like crazy. (laughs) So um, they're getting really creative just on, we have a daily stand-up every single day, which I strongly encourage for companies. It's a great way to just kind of stay in contact with everyone. Um, and you know, even then we're doing things last week. It was like, bring your pet on your zoom for the morning or bring your child. Um, after one of the meetings, the ones where we had bring your child to work day, someone hosted like a drawing class, you know, or, um, I forget what else we have, you know, virtual happy hours, a lot of the stuff that people are just trying to do to stay engaged and, and really just encouraging people to like take a break from work, make sure that you're connecting with individuals. Um, isolation is a real thing and, and so we want to just make sure that the team is, is happy and connected. Got it. Now, I've only, uh, I know I'm putting on the spot because you've only been with Influx Data for a month, but yeah. <laughs> is there anything that you've done that has driven productivity or improved the lives of the reps? I'd love to say that I have, um, but it's, it's so soon. Um, what I did do and what we're probably going to start doing more regularly, obviously each quarter, um, our VP right now and, and my boss is the director of ops, like they're putting together kind of these EBRs to kind of say, how did, how did we wrap the quarter and whatnot? What I used to do at Sauce Labs um, with my CRO is we would put these big retrospectives together quarterly and also annually to just show like, how are we trending? What can we start to look at? What, what are those uh, specific behaviors that kind of stand out? So that's something that I actually just finished up. And so we're going to start kind of taking some of those pieces along with their current EBR and put a new template together. One that can be leveraged internally with the executive team to kind of share abroad, but two also um, just different pieces to share with the board as well, right? And, and starting to pick up on areas where we could improve our sales efficiency. Got it. And I may be showing my ignorance here, but EVR or EBR, what does that stand for? Executive business review. Exact. I haven't heard that before. Executive. Oh, yeah. so the, this is the. This is something that you give to the board or to investors and leadership. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the EBR. Yeah. Typically, it, it could be used internally and externally. Like um, for the sake of my last company, we used to kind of come up with a, a big one, and it not only just entailed stuff that was specific to sales, but as we kind of grew and we continued partnering with marketing and um, partnering with CS was it became this huge presentation of kind of how did marketing do with their metrics as far as pipeline generation um, of that, how much of that was pipeline contribution, what happened to that pipeline during that quarter and what happened to our wins. And then therefore like, where did our turn come in with CS 
And also how many customers do we onboard and what's the success of that, right? And so what happens with that is like, it starts creating this very natural um, cohesion and collaboration between those departments. And when we start presenting it together, it really holds people accountable. It's easier to kind of see the kind of end to end flow from marketing all the way through CS. Um, and it just organically creates this like very clean, free flowing river, if you could say. So that's something that I think um, a lot of companies should use. I think it's really easy to kind of get siloed and just focus on your org and your metrics, but how does that impact the rest of the business? So something I'm encouraging Influx to do, I think they're doing it in some ways, but um, just to expand on that, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can cut data. And um, so we're kind of, that's just something we're starting to explore. Got it. That's super interesting. And so what I think you're saying is that by different teams coming together to produce this report and presenting the information together, it means you have, instead of departments being like pulling against each other, you have more likely to have the departments pulling together. Right. Yeah. You see, you see the effects, right? Like, so if marketing is crushing it and they're giving us all these leads, but for some reason we're not um, making our number, then it's on sales and marketing to kind of partner together and say, well, that's quite interesting, right? What's happening with our pipeline? Is there something with the data integrity? Is there something with our qualification criteria? Like, why are these falling out or are they getting pushed out? So those are things that you can start, you know, that's just an example, but those are things you can start to consider as far as um, how each organization is impacting another. If CS is having a really poor time onboarding, is it because there's a poor handoff and not enough information that's being fed from sales to CS? So, um, yeah, I, I have found that that's been a tremendous um, improvement within my last company and something I definitely encourage, you know, not not to just report independently, but report as an organization and, and uh, just together. For sure. I mean, at Evster, we have the sales and marketing sat marketing team sat together, but then we have our CF team over in San Diego. And so it's very much like sales and marketing can tackle those challenges together. But then sometimes when or the, the communication is just left good, right? Because it, wow. when we're in the office anyway, CS was over on the West Coast. Um, so that's something that we should be looking at. Um, next question. If yeah. you could only track one sales-related metric for the rest of your career, which would you choose? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. Um, one sales metric. Or to, to take off the pressure, it can just be your, your favorite one. My favorite sales metric? Uh, how many opportunities have been closed one? <laughs> yes. yes. I, think, I think that's the one that excites everyone the most. <laughs> Agreed. That's, that's the simple. Because I, I ask this question. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sometimes we get like really super complex, like advanced metrics that no one's heard of because they like show some some tiny inefficiency in the process. But then here we're just like Just show me the one. Yeah, how many deals? <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, cool. Um the the sales forecasting process at Influx Data, is that is that is that down to you and your ops director or do you involve finance? How, how does that process work? I think it's a little bit of both, right? So, um, and I'm still kind of wrapping my fingers around it. And so I can kind of speak both from my last company and from what I somewhat understand where we're at right now. Um, obviously, we're taking a look at our future quarters pipeline, right? And then we also need to apply our sales capacity and the quota that's been deployed there. So there's so many different ways that you can kind of take it into account. Um, but I think more so we kind of have this bottom up approach, right? Like, how much do we currently have sitting in commit? How much do we have sitting in, um, in I think we call it call, but like uh, your best case, it'd be commit most likely in your best case, we'll call it those three. So your top two, we're kind of taking into consideration like there's a strong likelihood that we should anticipate for that pipeline to close at the end of the quarter. And then from your best case, there's a few things that you may be able to call out, like maybe some large deals that you think you can push over the fence. Um, so we do just kind of the typical bottoms up approach. And then um, obviously the board has to approve if we haven't already had uh, our forecast um, laid out in front of them just yet. But uh, it's a little different the way that we do it here versus what I'm used to. But for this, for the most part, it's, it's pretty similar. Got it. Um, and then a final question. <laughs> Who uh, has inspired or educated you the most in your 
Ashley, is there ops or support ops career? Um, I would say two people. Um, I would say Tucker Callaway, who was the CRO, and um, Carolyn Beck, who actually brought me on initially at Sauce Labs. You know, from them, I worked pretty closely with Carolyn initially when I started Sauce Labs. And while she didn't have a sales background either, um, she's actually now a VP of marketing for the EMEA team and, and Sauce. Um, she taught me quite a bit, you know, and brought me on and really just gave me a lot of autonomy and uh, watched me through everything. And then working with Tucker specifically, you know, as the CRO, not only did he own sales, but he owned um, pretty much all of go to market, less like the actual marketing team. So anyone who was customer facing, he had them all. And um, I think collectively, it was kind of interesting for both of us to kind of go through sales ops together. Um, it wasn't necessarily a role he had leveraged a ton previously. So there was a lot of like trial and error between the two of us, but um, to support someone at that level and really understand like how we're reporting to the board and how we're forecasting and the things to really look at through these retrospectives um, really, really helped me grow. And it's been great to be able to bring some of my learnings and findings to Influx as well, um, just in comparison. So I think the two of them, and then there's one other person at Okta, Nettie. Um, he runs one of the sales and strategy teams there. And he's just incredible, super smart. Okta is a huge, huge company. So, you know, the things that he's doing as far as forecasting and, and scaling, um, I think is quite impressive. So, so actually I gave you three people. <laughs> I cheated. Yeah. So it's Tug Halloway, Carolyn, and then I didn't catch the third person's name. Nettie. Nettie. Nettie works at Okta. Yeah. Got it. Awesome. Okay, cool. Alicia, thank you so much for the insights. Here's a couple of things that I took out. I have two pages of notes here. Um, I think I, I really, I'm not sure this is something you said, but the, the, I think you mentioned when somebody, the person at Source Labs wanted to bring you on. I think their yeah. point about getting visibility of the post-sale operations being valuable for their cohesive viewpoint. And I, I think that was a, that's a very good point and a very good move probably by the fourth lab team to bring someone on yeah. who has the more holistic view. Um, yeah. And then the, <laughs> the obviously very like simple but effective metric that we selected um, <laughs> was it is, it is i'm not sure if i've had that i've done 80 interviews right and i'm not sure if anyone's just said number of deals closed so <laughs> i i think i think the message there that, like, the obvious answer and everyone else is, has such a greater <laughs> awful answers no but. no no not at all the message is that we have to focus on what matters yeah what answers have you gotten for that oh so many different answers like i've ha I've had to like spell out mathematical formulas one <laughs> one that i actually quite liked pipeline velocity like you there's like a formula for that right and so sure. these are more slightly advanced ones but actually the only reason we're doing any of these is to close the deals right so <laughs> that totally makes sense um alicia thank you so much for going on Yes, thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure speaking with you and I hope you're staying safe and healthy and happy out there.